Uh, please ask, ask, ask me any question if you have. I, maybe I write down the email. Thank you. <laughs> uh, maybe just my Gmail is fine. Or maybe I just type. So this is email. I can just type. Okay. Uh, maybe thanks. Okay, thank you.
Good. Uh, hello, Conlord, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Hi, hi, good to see you. you. <laughs> yeah, how are you? Good. Hello. Good. Hey, Kyun how are you? Very good. <laughs> so, by the way, so Kunat, uh, I uh, just shared your uh, Dropbox link uh, on the website. Would it be okay, or uh, do you prefer to share that in a more private way? Um, no, uh, uh, it, it, it's fine. Uh, okay. If, if, if it's, I assume it's on the website of the school. Uh huh. Yeah, that's okay. I, okay. I may send you an updated version. Uh, after the lectures, in case I find a mistake, but uh... <laughs> okay, okay, good. So uh, I, at the end, of, and at the end of the day, actually, I'm going to download your lecture notes, uh, and yeah. then I'm going to make a link, a new link instead of your Dropbox link. But yeah, for yes. now, I didn't have time to make a new link. No, that's fine. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's fine. So, by the way, can we check uh, the screen share just, uh, just in that's case? A good, that's a good thing, yes. Uh, yes. Okay, very good, very good. Ah. Hello, Conrad. Yes. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, so Sangjin. I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody can hear Conrad. So that's uh, probably your problem, but ah. probably you, you don't hear me too. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Now I can hear you. Hi. <laughs> okay. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Right. You you see the screen? Yep. Yeah, yeah, sure. Everything is good. Yep. Yes. Good. I think the title is slightly changed. That could no? be. Ah, yeah. okay. I can change it back, but <laughs> <laughs> It's a very early time in Netherlands, right? Uh, it's quarter to seven here, yeah. <laughs> wow. So it should be very contradicting to your ordinary lifestyle, I guess. <laughs> I still have children in school, so it's not that... Uh, oh, I see. Not yeah. that... Uh, mm. But it is earlier than normal. So, but uh, I, I had to I had to move this an hour early because I have to teach at eleven mm. at uh, locally. Mm. So now it's a vacation, right? And like the Leiden University. No, no, no. We, no? we actually we just started the semester again. Oh yeah, I see. I see. First, I see. first, first of February it started again. Okay, okay. Oh. So are you doing the on online classes or? No, we're uh, we're actually since uh, uh, since this semester we're fully uh, fully um, not not fully uh, physics is fully because we have small classes but up to seventy five students is just uh, normal. I see, I see. So every students are wearing a mask in the class or not? Um, <laughs> yes, you, 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 we do have to wear masks in class. Um, but presumably that there's a big press conference tomorrow. Presumably that will also uh, go because the, the ho hospitals in Holland are basically empty now. So uh -huh. it looks like it's it's passed. Uh -huh. I see. How is it in Korea? So it depends on the university, but in GIST, in my institutes, now we are, so the new semester will start uh, from March. And we are now discussing uh, uh, about the, the offline classes. Okay. So, so far, we were doing basically online classes. Yeah, yeah. So last semester, so we started first February. The semester before was indeed mostly online. 
but um, in fact, it was really it was really bad. We had a full lockdown again in December, like everything closed. Mm -hmm. But um, the peak went very up, very high, and came down very fast. So um, the last week of January, just before the semester started, they said you can open up again, which made a lot of students very happy. <laughs> And us, uh, us too, of course, but uh, mm. it's been really tough for the students. Mm. Yeah, I agree. It seems to, Sandy, you are in the now hotel room, right? Uh, no, actually, I am in my office. Uh, APCTP office? I am in APCTP, you see. Uh, but I, I heard there is a problem this morning. Then uh, I didn't hear about it, so I just came to I hear see. directly. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so there was, uh, I heard only after I arrived here, I heard that there is an, one outbreak uh. um, of COVID. <laughs> yeah. So, but I, I I actually don't care much nowadays anymore. I see. <laughs> so what about Hanyang University uh, so about online or offline classes from you semester? I, I, I didn't hear about anything, ah. but uh, actually I am not paying much attention because uh, I will be off the uh, class next, uh, ah. next year. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. I will be uh, what was the sabbatical? Mm -hmm. So maybe there was an email, but I didn't check. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, uh, out of curiosity, what is the correct one? Leiden University or Leiden University? I thought Leiden is the correct one, but Gunyong said it is Leiden. In, in, in Dutch, it's Leiden, and in English, Leiden? it's okay. Leiden. So. I see, I see. So, uh, Konrada, are, are you planning to uh, upload uh, the lecture notes day by day? Or? I, I will send each morning, I will send these slides uh -huh. before okay. my lecture. Okay, I see. Then uh, I will upload it in the website. Okay. So Hyunshik, uh, yes. Uh, when you're sharing the session, just uh, let people know about the lecture note. Now the lecture note is uh, uploaded in the website, so maybe okay. students, uh, it's useful for students. Okay, I see. You let me know when we start, okay?
Sure. Yep. Yeah, I'll let you know. Oh, it's already 2 p.m. Uh, sorry, 3 p.m. in Korean time. So, uh, shall we start? Yes, sure. Okay, good. Uh, okay, great. Uh, all right, uh, I think we should get started. Um, welcome back, everyone. Thanks for coming. And uh, let's resume our next lecture. Um, we are very happy to have Konrad Shalom, our next speaker from uh, Leiden University in Le uh, Netherlands. And um, he's going to give us uh, six lectures for three days about a uh, simple introduction to ADCFT and its application to condensed matter physics. And uh, this will be the first one out of the series. So um, please enjoy his wonderful lectures. And um, here's one more thing. There will be the le lecture note on the website. You can find it later. Okay, thank you. So you can start. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, yun -Sik. And uh, thank you very much to uh, Kyung Jung and Sang Jin and the other organizers. Uh, I'm honored to, uh, to speak here. Um, so also uh, uh, on the guidance uh, of uh, Kyung Jung, um, I, I will give a very, very basic introduction to ADS-CFT. I, I, I assume you know uh, very little about it. Uh, and it's based uh, in part also on uh, uh, on various chapters in the book that we wrote about holographic duality and its application to condensed matter physics. And for that reason, the, uh, the, um, the, the main part is actually the introduction to ADS-CFT. And what I will emphasize throughout is actually how do you do calculations? How do you actually compute things rather than the, the, the bigger picture? These were lectures that when I was a student, I always appreciated very much because you really learn something. The, ne the next morning you can do something. And for the bigger picture, I refer to you to perhaps some other lectures or to read the various chapters in our book where there's an introduction and a conclusion uh, and some of the more recent lectures. So, uh, okay, so let me first give you some context uh, and background. So ADS-CFT is what's known as a duality. And a duality, what it is, is a, is an, a different way of presenting the same physics. And it's different in a particular way that what is the strong coupling physics in the original theory is actually a, a perturbative expansion in the dual theory. And that means you can use perturbation theory. There's a small parameter to compute things which normally are uh, in that other viewpoint, which um, you could not compute before because they were beyond the reach of perturbation theory. And the simplest example of such a duality is actually ordinary uh, Maxwell U1 electrodynamics. So you see here the action for relativistic electrodynamics with a coupling constant uh, G squared and uh, the Maxwell tensor squared is the action. And as you know, uh, the, this action um, relies on the fact that the field strength F mu nu obeys a Bianchi identity, which means that the completely anti-symmetric derivative of F mu nu is zero and that means that F nu rho can be written in terms of the vector potential A rho. It's the anti-symmetric derivative of the vector potential. And that is the dynamical field that, uh, uh, which uh, enters into the action. When you look at small perturbations, you look at small perturbations in the vector potential. And so when you vary that, you get the equation of motion. And that is uh, the ordinary uh, Gauss law, where you take the divergence of F mu nu is equal to if you would include uh, electric sources, which I haven't done in the action here, but it would be uh, an electric source term on the right-hand side of your equation of motion. Now, what you can do, uh, and this was done by uh, Dirac already uh, in the early uh, 30s, uh, is you can introduce a magnetic monopole charge. We, in the real world, there are no magnetic monopoles, but you can introduce a magnetic monopole charge sort of as a, as a theoretical playground and then you have a, a system of equations when you combine the Bianchi identity and the equation motion, which are more symmetric. You have a divergence of F mu nu rho uh, of, of, is uh, the electric source term and the exterior derivative or the anti-symmetric derivative of F nu rho is the, the magnetic monopole charge. And the fact that they are now symmetric means that there is a different way of looking at these equations of motion you can now think of the Bianchi identity, not as an, ex, an, an, an identity which holds always, 
but rather as an equation of motion. In other words, right? You can you can vary the field configurations such that they uh, only obey the equations of motion on shell. And this you can make manifest, right? You can actually write down an action where the Bianchi identity is an equation of motion by not writing an action for the vector potential A, but writing a vector, an action for the field strength F directly. So now the dynamical field is F and not A. And then you introduce a Lagrange multiplier field, which I've called A tilde. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Collard. Collard, I think yes. the screen is, uh, are you trying to change the slide? All I can yes. see is the first page, the front page. Okay. Um, all right, There's let's try it again. Do you okay, see that? now we can see it. Yes, we can see it. Okay, so this was, uh, so as a small repeat, this was the Maxwell electrodynamics. This is the action, I apologize for that. And here you have the Bianchi identity, which uh, results in the fact that F nu rho can be written as a vector, the, the anti-symmetric derivative of the vector potential. And in short, there is a, this is the equation of motion for uh, the, <coughs> that results from the action of Maxwell electrodynamics. And so to, uh, to briefly take a step back, because you've not seen the slides before, right? Is uh, what I was telling you in words, now you can see here uh, on the slide, is that if you introduce a magnetic monopole charge, you can write down the equation of motion and the Bianchi identity in a symmetric way, right? Uh, they both have a source term on the right-hand side. And this means that you can, uh, there, should, there is a way to think of the Bianchi identity as an equation of motion rather than an exact identity. Remember, an equation of motion is something that only is satisfied after you do a variational principle, whereas a Bianchi identity is identically satisfied always. You can make the Bianchi identity an equation of motion manifest by rewriting the action now, not with a dynamical field A, but considering the field strength F itself as a dynamical field, and then enforcing the Bianchi identity through a Lagrange multiplier field. So if you, uh, and uh, that's the normal way you enforce a constraint in classical mechanics. So if you take now the equation of motion with respect to A, a tilde, you find the Bianchi identity as an equation of motion, which has as solution the fact that the field strength should be the anti-symmetrized derivative of the vector potential. And if you substitute that back in, you get back the original Maxwell action. So in some way, this is a slightly more general description. But you can do now do something else. You can also integrate out the field strength itself. After you can, this do, it goes as follows. You can complete squares, right? By writing the action uh, as follows. And then I have this second term here on the right-hand side. And now, as you know, uh, uh, when you have completed squares in a path integral or whatever, or you can uh, enforce the equation of motion, this just vanishes if it's a quadratic term. And you're left with uh, an effective action, which is only looks like an effective action for the Lagrange multiplier field A tilde. In this particular case, because the Bianchi identity is not one equation, but it's actually uh, um, a multiple set of equations, the Lagrange multiplier was a vector field, A tilde sigma. And the term that appears when you integrate out F mu nu is the anti-symmetric derivative of this Lagrange multiplier field sigma. So if you now, this now looks exactly like the Maxwell action before, if you define a field strength F tilde, which is F tilde rho sigma. The only difference is that the g squared, the coupling constant, now appears in the numerator and not in the denominator if you compare this to the original Maxwell action as you see above here. Now, all we've done here is some mathematical manipulations. We haven't changed anything of the physics. So this means that there is an equivalent description of the physics where the coupling constant is not g squared, but um, one over g squared. Uh, 
And if you go back to the description uh, of your seed, you see that this is a description where the fundamental charges are not electric, but the fundamental charges are magnetic. So this is known as electric magnetic duality in the system. And if you take an, a, 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 a viewpoint where the electric charges are the fundamental charges, then G is the sm correct small parameter and you can expand it. However, if you take the viewpoint that the magnetic monopoles are the fundamental charges, then this G tilde, which is one over the original G, is the correct expansion parameter. But there, when G tilde is small, that means one over G is big. And so you're actually studying the strong coupling theory from the point of view of the electric uh, fundamental charges. And this is the prototypical example of a duality, right? So in this particular case, we can derive it with some very simple manipulations, but it shows you that there are descriptions of the physics from two different perspectives, but the power of these two different perspectives is, is that one description is the weak coupling, original weak coupling uh, description, and the other is uh, the strongly coupled description of the original description, but is weak coupling in the dual description. And this allows you to access the strongly coupled region of the original theory by doing a weak coupling computation on the other side. And that is the essence of uh, ADS-CFT. And this is what you will see uh, as we go on uh, in the story. But before we do that, uh, it's useful to actually know what these terms ADS and uh, CFT mean. So we're gonna start today's lecture with just reviewing some aspects of uh, ADS and, uh, and CFT before we go to the duality. So what I'm going to go to now is to discuss some features of anti de Sitter space. So we go back to our knowledge of uh, general relativity where we have a dynamical space time, which can also be curved. And one way to, to look at all the possible space times that you have uh, in, in your plethora of general relativities is to classify them through symmetries. Now, the symmetries of space-time have a, have a special name. They're called isometries, uh, and they are special coordinate transformations under which the metric is invariant. And let me emphasize this again, because in uh, general relativity, when you have a dynamical space-time, you can, of course, always change coordinates. I mean, that is the essence of general relativity, that the coordinates do not matter for the physics. The, the physics is coordinate invariant and you can choose convenient coordinate choices to describe the physics in a convenient way. Coordinates themselves don't really have a fundamental meaning. Sort of coordinate invariant concepts like the Ricci scalar curvature, they are the fundamental concepts that have meaning. Nevertheless, right, we all know that there are special space times that are, have, have certain symmetries and you should see that uh, in the representation of the metric. And these special symmetries are called isometries. And uh, under these isometries, it's the metric itself which is invariant, right? So the Ricci scalar curvature is always invariant under any coordinate transformation. It's a gauge invariant concept. But now we're looking at objects where the metric it itself is invariant. Now, if you recall, an infinitesimal coordinate transformation is really a vector. Here it's denoted with psi mu of x. And under a coordinate transformation, the metric transforms as the symmetrized covariant derivative. This is the covariant derivative um, of psi mu. So if you find a special coordinate transformation where the metric does not change, then the variation of the metric vanishes. And so the symmetrized derivative of d mu psi nu is zero. And for such a, a symmetry, by definition, this must be zero. So what, if you have a space-time, you try to look for all the possible special vectors which obey this relation. And the vectors which obey this relation have also a special name. They're called killing vectors. So with each isometry, there is an associated killing vector and vice versa. Now, the simplest space times are those which have the most symmetries in the same way um, that, that the, the circle is sort of the simplest two-dimensional object. So they have the most killing vectors. Now, it's very easy to see what those possible simplest space times are because a d-dimensional 
a metric, which is a symmetric matrix, it has D, D plus one over two components. So since if I have a specific killing vector, what I can do is I can choose special coordinates where one of those, which fixes one of those uh, components of the metric, right? If I have a translationally invariant space-time, it's useful to choose one of the coordinates along that translational invariance direction. If I have rotational invariant space-time, it's convenient to choose a radial direction and an angular direction. And under the angular direction, the metric does not change. So in the same way that if you have the, the most possible symmetries you can therefore possibly have is D, D plus one over two. Then you have essentially fixed all the freedom you have in your metric and there can never be any more. The space times that have such an amount of killing vectors, this maximal amount are called maximally symmetric. And these vectors together will form a group. They, not, they don't necessarily have to uh, commute. They're not independent. If I take one killing vector and I follow that up by a second killing vector, that need not be the same as following, uh, starting with the second killing vector and doing the first killing vector. But then together, they're still in killing transformation. So together, they must give a third killing vector. And that way, they will build up a group. And this group, therefore, it has D plus one killing vectors. These are the infinitesimal transformations. So it has this group must have D over D plus one over two generators. Now, what is the simplest group that we know that has D, D plus one over two generators? That is the group SO D plus one. The, uh, the orthogonal group uh, uh, that acts on vectors with D plus one indices. This seems very logical, and natural, but of course, this does not take into account that the space times we consider in general relativity are Lorentzian. This is a non Lorentzian group, right? So we, have, we must account for the Lorentzian. And if you do that, it turns out that there are only three distinct Lorentzian maximally symmetric space times. And they are, again, as like we said, they are classified by the group formed of their killing vectors. And the three that you find are the following three. You can have SOD comma one, that would be a very natural one, thinking about Lorentzian symmetry. And this turns out to be what's known as D-dimensional de Sitter space. You can have SOD minus two comma two. This turns out to be anti-de Sitter space. This is the one we'll focus on later. And then there is a third one, which is ISOD minus one comma one, which is really SOD minus one comma one times uh, in a semi-direct product with translations. And that's D-dimensional Minkowski space. So if you take the ordinary Lorentz group of SOD minus one comma one with translations together, that is a maximally symmetric space time. It's very easy to understand. And this is ordinary Minkowski space that we know very well. But here we will focus on particular anti de Sitter space. So the, the real power of uh, these maximally symmetric space times is the fact that uh, the, uh, essentially every single point is cannot be any different from any other point because there's so much symmetry in the system you can reach any other point by a, a sequence of uh, killing uh, motion uh, and therefore since these are related by by symmetries these are isometries of the manifold the point that you reach is not different than any other point think of being on a circle or on the surface uh, uh, of a sphere the surface of the earth Right? If the Earth were perfectly spherical, it doesn't matter which point you are on, it all uh, will look the same. And that's uh, the essence of a maximally symmetric space-time. Every point is the same. And this must be reflected in their curvature. Right? If every point is the same, the curvature of this space-time cannot have a derivative expansion because it doesn't matter which point you are. And that means you can really write down what the Riemann tensor of such a space-time is. It can only be proportional to the metric itself because that's what the Riemann tensor is built of. And there must be some proportionality constant. And then since you know that the Riemann tensor has certain symmetry properties, the only combination of the metric that has the certain correct symmetry properties is sort of a, a, a mixed uh, or an anti-symmetrized product of two metric tensors. So just because of this notion of maximal symmetry, you already know without any computation that the Riemann tensor must take this form, r mu nu rho sigma is equal to a constant C 
times g mu rho g nu sigma minus g mu sigma g mu rho. And c must be a constant for that same reason that we explained before. It cannot depend on any point in time. Now, then it's easy to find the Ricci tensor and the Ricci scalar curvature. They are just follow from contractions with g mu nu. Now, what this also tells you, in fact, that all these maximally symmetric space times are, in fact, solutions to the vacuum Einstein equations, but those with a cosmological constant. And the constant is precisely related to this value c. Now, note that these are the vacuum Einstein equations. So I have not put any matter in here or uh, any uh, objects. They're the, they're the solutions to the Einstein equations where t mu nu, the stress energy tensor, uh, is zero. And then from this simple contraction uh, or the simple notion of maximally symmetric space time, you can find out that when you contract it with metric, the relation between the cosmological constant lambda and this constant c is uh, as follows. c is 2 lambda divided by d minus 1 times d minus 2 for a d-dimensional space time. Now, remember, in Lorentzian signature, we had three of these possible maximally symmetric space times. And those three correspond precisely sort of to the three different categories of cosmological constants that you could conceivably have. You could have a positive cosmological constant. This corresponds, turns out to correspond to the sitter space. You can have zero cosmological constant. That's the space time we know very well. That's Minkowski space time. And then you can have a negative cosmological constant that corresponds to anti de Sitter space. So this actually is in a nutshell what anti de Sitter space is, or it's act actually, in fact, a definition of anti de Sitter space. It's the maxly symmetric Lorentzian space time that's the unique solution to vacuum Einstein equations with a negative cosmological constant. So this is slightly the bigger picture, right? We've seen anti space, it's very symmetric. And, and, uh, symmetric means, it, in essence, you can think of it as a sort of as a vacuum space-time. There's no particular stuff floating around because then space-time would curve around that stuff, right? And But it's the particular stuff where there is a constant sort of uh, energy density in, in the universe, which corresponds to a negative cosmological constant. Now, we've not computed the metric itself yet, uh, and that's the next step we're going to do, and that's going to give us some more intuition what it actually looks like. And we can easily see that by the fact that we already know what maximally symmetric Euclidean spaces are, or actually, you may not realize that, but you have secretly known all of these all along. The maximally symmetric Euclidean spaces are, in fact, the sphere, that's the corresponding Euclidean space with Euclidean signature, where the thing that you could call the cosmological constant is positive. There's flat space, Euclidean, Cartesian, flat space again. And there's the hyperboloid, famously. That's the one where the cosmological constant in Euclidean space would be negative. So the sitter space, another way to view at look at the sitter and anti the sitter space is that the sitter space is the Lorentzian generalization of the sphere. And anti elicitor space is the Lorentzian generalization of the hyperboloid. And that gives us now a handle on how to compute, how to construct the metric for anti elicitor space. Just, let's think of the sphere first. That's easy. Just as a d dimensional sphere is defined as, uh, in Euclidean space as the set of points that obey the following constraint, you actually build it as an embedding in a space time with one dimension larger. So you construct x1 squared plus x2 squared plus xd plus 1 squared, and you set that equal to the radius of the sphere. And just to recall, the hyperboloid is then constructed as an object with a negative, looks like a negative radius squared, but you need to also change the sign of one of these components. So a hyperboloid is naturally an object which is embedded in a Lorentzian space-time. But that's the Euclidean hyperboloid is naturally embedded in a Lorentzian space-time. And in the same way, d-dimensional anti de Sitter space is the generalization uh, to Lorentzian space of the hyperboloid. And for that to embed it, I need a second object with a negative sign. So a d-dimensional anti de Sitter space is naturally embedded in a space-time which has two negative 
components in the metric, right? And that means you immediately see the uh, isometries. The isometries are just inherited from the embedding space. They are the SOD minus one comma two rotational symmetry in the embedding space. And this is actually exactly how it works for the ordinary hyperboloid or for the sphere, right? The sphere, uh, a two sphere has actually SO3 symmetry. And that's precisely from the fact that you can think of the sphere as the set of points embedded in ordinary three-dimensional space. And it's the rotational symmetry. We know that that's SO3 in three dimensions, but the sphere clearly is invariant under all of these rotations. And so the sphere, the metric on the sphere inherits all these symmetries from its embedding space. And that's exactly the same that happens here in anti sitter space. It inherits the, rotation, the rotational symmetry with two opposite signs. Now that we know this, we can construct the metric. By the way, if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to interrupt or try to throw it in the, in the chat and I'll try to answer as I go along. So anti space is defined as the embedding of this. And then in the same way that you construct the sphere, you try to find a, a, a set of uh, coordinates, which specifically obeys this relation. And here is one specific solution to this defining relation. Sort of in the general, in the analogy, by finding the solution to uh, the constraint equation for a sphere, say for a, Two sphere is just uh, r cosine theta plus r sine theta, or for a three sphere, it's r cosine theta, r sine theta cos sine theta one cosine theta two, etc. Here is the defining solution for an arbitrary d-dimensional anti de Sitter space. Because I have two minus signs, I have to ha use twice sort of the trick of the geometric uh identity that cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one and in fact i also have, need to use the hyperbolic variant uh, at one point and then once i have this solution you can verify this yourself now it's very easy to compute the metric i assume that this is an exercise you have all done in general relativity you write down the metric of the embedding space this is the full metric, the trivial metric in the flat embedding space in SO2 comma or SOD minus one comma two. And then you simply substitute in this, these coordinates. You do that, you need to do some algebra, but at the end of the day, you find the following solution to the, um, the metric of anti distributed space, where S, this combination D capital omega squared D minus two is the metric on a D minus two dimensional sphere, SO D minus, SD minus two. This is the metric of anti de Sitter space. And uh, we're gonna now study it in a little bit to get a feeling uh, for what it is. Now, there's one thing you should notice is that if you look very careful, there's a T here, T will play the role of time, but in the ordinary uh, embedding space, this T is periodic in this case with period two pi. So the actual anti de Sitter space follows by unrolling T. You just pretend as if the T is no longer uh, periodic. And that's of course true because time, as time evolves, it's not true that after two pi units of time, we come back to ourselves. Before we continue, there should be something uh, very, uh, emphasize at this moment that this specific coordinate system, I have not chosen any particular solution to this defining relation. I've chosen a very special one, and it's a global coordinate system. This actually is a coordinate system that covers the full space time of anti de Sitter space. This is very special. Most space times, essentially all space times do not have a global coordinate system. You must always have different patches where you do a coordinate transformation to go from one patch to another patch. And even an ordinary sphere in uh, an ordinary sphere uh, in higher dimensions, it's difficult to find a global coordinate system. 
But in this particular case, anti-de-sitter space has such a global coordinate system which covers every single part uh, of the universe, of its, of its space time. However, uh, even though this is a global coordinate system, it doesn't really tell us uh, or doesn't give us a good intuition what's going on. So let's transform to a different coordinate system where this hyperbolic direction right here, there's this hyperbolic direction, cosh tau squared. It's, it's now infinite, right? Tau can run from minus infinity to infinity, but we're going to transfer to a finite range by using the following combination, where rho is now bounded between zero and pi over two. In these coordinates, the metric becomes as follows. And now you see something uh, rather interesting because the object between parentheses here is something we, we recognize. Right, this almost looks like the rho squared sine squared rho the omega squared. This looks like uh, uh, radial coordinates, and then there's a, a time coordinate here, the t squared, which is independent. And so this metric, but there's also this overall factor r squared over cosine squared rho. Now, if I ignore if I'm able to ignore this overall factor, r squared over cosine squared rho, then I can understand what's going on here. And let's do that, in fact. This, what this only, the only thing that this r squared over cosine squared rho do is it recalibrates my distances. In fact, it tells me that the distance rho is pi over two is precisely an infinite distance, an infinite real physical distance away from the point rho is zero. That's of course was the whole point of this transformation that it took an infinite distance to a finite range. But if I ignore this recalibration, then this object tells us what the topology is of the space time is, right? If I, if I am allowed to crunch distances in an arbitrary amount, this tells me the shape of it. And you recognize that here that this is, like I said, this is just a radio coordinate system, but it's a radio coordinate system up to a finite distance. So uh, you, you take a radio coordinate up to a fine distance, and then you stop. And then there's a direction which is orthogonal to this radial distance, which continues forever. Now, that's what you recognize. This is, therefore, a cylinder, right, with a radial distance rho. There's a spherical bit sitting here. And then there's a, a, a regular, so the height of the cylinder is given by t. So here you see a, a, a picture of what ADS, the topology of ADS looks like. Rho is zero is the center. Rho is pi over two is the edge. That's where I supposed to end my cylinder. But recall again that in actual physical units, this distance is an infinite distance away. And then there's the direction. This should have been a T, not a tau. This is this direction T, uh, which, um, is the unrolled time direction which continues for inf uh, an infinite region. Now, because this, so the, the topologically it's a cylinder, but as I emphasized, officially this distance is uh, an infinite distance away. And what you've ignored is this prefactor r squared over cosine squared rho. This is sometimes known as the conformal factor, right? Under a conformal, under a scale transformation, you can change this uh, arbitrarily. So therefore, this edge, right, where rho is pi over two, is not a true boundary of a ADS. It's a conformal boundary. If you could ignore this distance, right, you um, can, uh, you would reach it in a finite uh, distance r rho, but in real life, the distance is, is infinite. Note, however, there's something special here then. If you have a light ray, which travels along null geodesics, and null geodesics are precisely those where ds is null, it doesn't care about this conformal factor. So light rays, in fact, can reach the, um, the, the boundary in uh, uh, a finite time, so to say. I emphasize this conformal boundary because this will uh, play a very important role in how to construct the ADS CFT duality. So it's all very useful to keep in mind the topology of ADS, that it's this, this cylinder type topology where there's an interior at row is zero, and then there's this conformal boundary at some finite radial distance row. 
Now, uh, again, this is this is a global coordinate system, but because of the this uh, angular factor, it's not the most convenient. It's sometimes a little bit more difficult to compute. So there's a third different convenient coordinate system for anti sitter space, which is the following system. This is ds squared, it's r squared over z squared, dz squared minus dc squared minus dx, where dx1 plus, da, da, plus dx d minus 2 squared. And this is convenient because this factor, if you ignore the dz squared, which is the analog of the radial direction, this is just a flat Minkowski space. And uh, there's a very simple prefactor, which is r squared over z squared. Now, these coordinates, they don't cover, they are not a global coordinate system. They only cover half of ADS, but you see here, right? And the Minkowski space is just the, this gray zone here. This is, uh, um, uh, looks like a diamond, right? And you know that in conformal coordinates, Minkowski space, maybe you remember this from general relativity, can be re represented uh, as a diamond. Uh, and where Z is now the radial direction. So the, the Poincaré coordinates, roughly speaking, cover only half of your anti sister space time. OK. So uh, what I have included uh, in these lectures is for yourself to work out some, some simple problems that you can try to do. Uh, here's a simple uh, example on uh, trying to work with dualities. And then I have some simple uh, problem sets where you can verify how anti sitter space uh, emerges, and in particular, how the Poincaré coordinates emerge in the system. OK, let's now start um, with, uh, uh, we've done a small review uh, of ADS, right? Um, and now we have to start to relate this to the conformal symmetry. So remember, we started with classifying ADS as a maximally symmetric space-time, where we emphasize that the maximally symmetric referred to the way the metric itself is invariant under certain special coordinate transformations. And these are the isometries. And uh, we, we classified the isometries of this system. They had to be uh, of dimension d, d plus one over two. And this corresponded to the, um, in this particular case, to the special group SOD, comma two. Now, I, in a preview to uh, how ADS CFT going to, to work, I emphasized already that we have in this topology of ADS, there's this conformal boundary. And what we're going to focus on now is how these isometries, these, these special uh, corner changes under which the metric does not change, how they manifest themselves on this conformal boundary. And it turns out that the boundary inherits not just the translation and rotational invariance, but in fact, a full, the full invariance under SOD, comma two. Let me emphasize once again, uh, let me emphasize in a different way what I mean by this sentence. If I go back to the Poincaré coordinates here, right? Now in these coordinates, the boundary is at Z is zero. Now, no matter what value of C is, you see here the SO uh, one comma D minus two Lorentz symmetry is sort of manifest. So the boundary clearly has this symmetry. But the point that I want to emphasize is that the Isometries of ADS give this boundary more symmetry than just the naive rotational symmetry. Or if I take the global picture, the SOD, comma, D, um, D minus one, comma, one symmetry that is associated with the rotations of the sphere plus the, uh, trans the, the translations uh, in time itself. The, the the full SOD comma the full SOD comma two isometries are in fact reflected on the boundary. 
And that is what I want to show here. So let's look at SOD, 2 as the conformal group. Now, this is just a generalization of the orthogonal group. And if you remember, maybe the generators of the orthogonal group, they form the following algebra. Uh, the commutator of Mij, MKL, is eta jk, where this is the metric now with two minus signs, m ideal plus the permutations. Where Mij are the anti-symmetric matrices, the generators of the orthogonal group are anti-symmetric matrices, and eta jk is the SOD metric. And this simply directly follows from the rotations in Rd, 2, right? In Rd, 2, the um, rotations are just generated by the anti-symmetrized combination of uh, x hat and p hat. This you remember from quantum mechanics. Now, how do I interpret this algebra? This is the conformal group. Uh, so this is uh, the, the conformal group in D dimensions. Now in D dimensions, you see that this group has far more sort of naturally works on a vector with D plus two indices, but I only have natural vectors in D dimensions, which are D indices. And moreover, it's a D, uh, this is the Lorentzian conformal group. So it naturally works on a, uh, uh, contains the Lorentz group, which is the rotations in D minus one comma one dimensions. So the way to understand this system is to uh, isolate within this SOD comma two, the Lorentz subgroup. And then there's some other part remaining, which uh, naturally is uh, an SO one comma one group. And what you do is in this SO one comma one group, you write this in light cone coordinates. In other words, you identify the non-trivial generators in the following way. In light cone coordinates, you call M plus minus, you call the generator D, you call MI minus PI, and MI plus, you call KI. And if you do this, this may seem a little bit abstract, but you can now take the full generating algebra of SOD, comma two, and when you write it out, you get the following algebra. In the directions i, j, these are now the ordinary Lorentzian di directions. I have not written them as mu nu, right? But this is the ordinary Lorentz algebra, S O D minus one comma one. And now you look at the remaining uh, algebra from S O D comma two. So if I pick, say, this index L to be minus, and this is mk minus, and mk minus, remember, I called pk. So, and I just write down the on the right hand side the um, non zero part that remains. Now, remember that I've chosen these light cone coordinates for uh, the two remaining directions, uh, but in the way I've decomposed it, right, there are no mixed non-zero indices of this metric, right? This metric is only non-zero non if there are two components in the D minus one, comma uh, one direction or two components in the SO one, comma one direction. So this is what you have. And that means that you always have a minus index remaining on these generators. And those are again identified as the PI generators. This is nothing more, this looks, this sounds rather confusing, but this is nothing more the fact that the statement that this object PK, which has a single index, transforms as a vector under rotations, under Lorentz rotations uh, in the ordinary Lorentzian space time. So PA is, is an object which is naturally a vector in the d-dimensional Lorentzian space time. The generator D, interestingly enough, commutes with the ordinary Lorentz generators. The generator K, which is just the choice where L is a plus sign, also transforms as a vector under the SOD minus one comma one Lorentz transformation. The PI with D itself, that gets more interesting. It returns D PI itself with a object one, 
So does D with KK. And then there's this funny combination where you take PI with KK uh, and it gives a combination of D and a rotation. Now, when you look at this a little bit more careful and you, and you, and you, and you see how they act, you can say that PI is actually the generator of translations. You get, simply get this out for free. Where D turns out to be the generator of dilatations. It turns out to be the generator that changes the size of space-time. That is the whole aspect of conformal transformations. And the one curious one, these are actually easily identified, is this object Ki. Ki is what's known as the generator of special conformal transformations. And the easiest way to think about what a special conformal transformation is, is an object that flips scales. Now, these statements may, uh, may sound uh, uh, strange, but let me, let's go a little bit more uh, into, into detail. The conformal group, right, is actually not much more than the, the Poincaré group. Remember, the Poincaré group is the um, Lorentz group combined with translations, right? And we've already seen the Lorentz group here, that's MIJ. PI are the translations, right? And then I have need one more uh, object. And the object that it combines with is this flipping of scales. It's inversions. An inversion is nothing but the operation where you take uh, the point x mu and you invert it. You write it down as the x mu divided by x squared. The subtlety about inversions that as a group element, although strictly speaking of OD, two, net S OD, is that it's not connected to the identity. And if it's not connected to the identity, you cannot write it as E to uh, a generator, and therefore it doesn't appear naturally in the algebra. But its manifestation in the algebra is through this funny operator Ki. And this Ki you can show is nothing more, this special conformal animation is that an inversion followed by a translation, and then again an inversion. And because it has now two, um, because the inversion now appears twice in Ki, Ki itself is connected to the identity and therefore it is the object that shows up in the algebra. And then once I have Ki, right, and I have translations, then this naturally, this, this dilatation operator, the operator which actually is easy to understand, the operator for scale transformation naturally appears in the algebra. And then you have a closed system. So the easy, easy way to think about the conformal group is really the Lorentz, uh, Lorentz boosts, translations, and inversions. And it gives you dilatations for free. And now I can argue that the, um, how the anti de Sitter isometries and the conformal symmetry uh, um, are related or uh, in fact, the key point that I want to do as a first step towards the, showing the ADS-CFT correspondence is how the boundary inherits the full conformal group from the isometries of ADS. Now, in these Poincaré coordinates, that's the, these coordinates right here, the translations, the translation symmetry in the directions mu and nu, and the Lorentz boosts here are already directly present. You can literally see them in the metric, right? Moreover, they are also clearly invariant under this scale transformations. If I take x mu to lambda x mu and z to lambda z, also this metric is invariant. So that's also an isometry. And therefore on the boundary, I also have that scale transformations are immediately inherited from ADS space. So the boundary, which is the surface at Z is zero, automatically has scale transformations, Lorentz transformations, and uh, translations. To show invariance under the full conformal group, the one object therefore I have to remain to show is either invariance under the special conformal transformations, but as I mentioned a moment ago, 
it's much easier to think of conformal trend, the, the conformal group as generated by the Poincaré group plus inversions. And you can actually check that these Poincaré coordinates, they're also invariant under the following sort of, this is not an infinitesimal transformation, but this is a large transformation under the following, let's call it an inversion symmetry. It's not strictly an inversion, but it looks very much like the inversion symmetry uh, form. If you do this transformation, this large transformation, you can show that this metric actually does not change. And you see that on the boundary, Z is zero, where Z is zero, then Z does not uh, change. But this reduces precisely to the inversion symmetry that I wrote down here. And now you see how this in isometry is therefore inherited by the conformal boundary, precisely as an inversion symmetry. And this is therefore, the boundary therefore has Lorentzian, boosts, translation symmetry, and inversion symmetry. And that means it's invariant under the full conformal loop. And this is the first step towards um, ADS CFT. We've now seen that the boundary itself it inherits, right? The, 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 the conformal boundary of ADS inherits from the isometries of ADS the full uh, the symmetries in the representation of the conformal group. So that is the, the aspect that uh, uh, I wanted to show. Now, there's one more uh, aspect where I want to show. I'm, I'm, I'm clearly going a little bit faster than uh, with a slide representation than under normal aspects. So please don't really don't hesitate if you have any questions. We've now shown you uh, what anti de Sitter space is. We've shown you what the symmetries of anti de Sitter space are. And we've shown you that how the, the symmetries of anti de Sitter space, or rather the isometries, get inherited on the conformal boundary uh, as the conformal group. So that is the ADS part of ADS CFT. Now let us focus a little bit on the CFT part of ADS CFT before we go to um, uh, use that uh, in detail. So what is a conformal field theory? Well, conformal field theory is precisely a special relativistic d-dimensional quantum field theory which now has this larger symmetry group, SOD, 2, rather than only the Lorentz group, SOD, minus 1, 1. And this may sound very simple, but it actually has very deep consequences. Consider a, a normal, ordinary quantum field theory. We all know that quantum field theories, right? They, one of the key aspects that you learn in your introductory quantum field theory is that they uh, need to be renormalized to make sense of them or to compute observables in, the, in this theory. This renormalization is a very special feature where uh, uh, it tells you that even if there is no natural scale in this standard quantum field theory, there is a secretly always a scale dependence in the system. Right? The, you have to adjust the values of your coupling constants depending on the scale at which you measure the theory. So a generic QFT, no matter how you write down, always has a scale dependence in the system. However, a CFT, because one of the operator, one of the generators of the conformal algebra is the dilatation or scale transformations. And if a theory is invariant under scale transformations, it cannot have a scale dependence. So CFTs, by definition, are scale-independent quantum field theories. And if you now connect it with the previous statement, that must mean that CFTs, some another, are quantum field theories that do not renormalize. And that's exactly the deep fundamental uh, importance of conformal field theories compared to quantum field theories. They do not renormalize. All the beta functions and all the anomalous dimensions in CFTs must, must be exactly zero. Because if they were not, then there would secretly be a scale dependence and therefore it cannot be invariant under the dilatation operator, under the scale transformation. Now, if all the beta functions and all the anomalous dimensions are exactly zero, 
right? That means that you can reorganize or you can regroup or you can, uh, uh, sorry, you can organize the theory knowing this fact, right? So what you actually do is you reorganize all the operators in your theory, which normally are you organize by spin or by representations of the Lorentz group. You don't now don't organize them by orga, uh, representation of the Lorentz group, but you organize them by representations of this larger SOD comma two group. And where the scaling dimension becomes now a quantum number of this operator, which does not change. Okay, so what you do is you reorganize all the excitations in your system in terms of an operators, which have specific scaling dimension. And the definition of a scaling dimension is that as you do a scale transformation, it transforms as follows, right? If you think of the operator with scaling dimension delta at the point lambda x, that is equivalent to the operator delta at the point x multiplied by the overall scale to the minus delta. This means under a scale transformation, that is how it scales, okay? Now, once you know this, that means due to conformal invariance, which includes translations, that means that the two-point function must be invariant under translations, so it can only depend on the relative distance between the two, right? It means that the two-point function of such operators is completely fixed by the symmetries in the system up to a normalization. <laughs> Is there is there a question? Okay, and the normalization, in fact, for a two point function, usually you're free to set the normalization. So in this particular case, we'll do that, and we simply normalize it to unity. So the two point function of of two operators uh, for a scalar operator, there are no extra uh, tensor structures. If you have a vector operator, there's a specific tensor structure, which must appear, but it's, it's very easy to determine what it is. So it's completely fixed by um, conformal symmetry. And like I said, even this normalization, you can set to unity. The only thing you need to know is its scaling dimension. Moreover, the three-point function is completely fixed up to a single constant, which you can think of as the interaction between these three. Uh, operators. There's a single constant C delta one, delta two, delta three, but the whole space-time structure is completely fixed by the conformal symmetries in the system. This is not so hard to derive yourself. For the four-point function, it gets a little bit more tricky, uh, and there's a whole uh, mathematical structure that that tries to uh, show how you can determine the four-point function again from the three-point function. And if you combine this with unitarity, you get a very uh, uh, powerful set of relations that is called the bootstrap methods, which may be uh, at this winter school or another winter school uh, or another PhD school, someone may lecture you uh, on, on its own. This is a topic on its own that has uh, been revitalized in the last number of years. But the key part is that the conformal symmetry is an extremely powerful constraining feature uh, in many of these, these theories uh, th that simply determine the structure of correlation functions already based on the symmetries. However, there is still remaining non-trivial uh, non information. You need to know the spectrum of its operators. You need to know which the operators are in your system. And you need to know these physical constants, C delta one, delta two, uh, and delta three. Now, they're not only interesting conformal field theories from the point of view of a uh, uh, of a mathematical or a quantum field theory structure, but it's precisely this aspect that they do not renormalize that makes them so interesting. But they're also extremely important in real life physics. The importance is their role in the critical phenomena and universality. If you have a second order phase transition, it is we know that this, uh, we have understood that this is driven by the divergence of the correlation length, the length scale at which operators um, correlate with each other. This is, the, this is really the dominant intrinsic scale in any system. But if it diverges, then this intrinsic length scale disappears. And therefore, there's no intrinsic scale in the system anymore. And that means that at the critical point, at the second order phase transition, this 
um, system has an emergent scaling symmetry. And the physics at this point can be therefore described by a CFT. Moreover, because the intrinsic scale, that's the remnant of the microscopic physics disappears, it's described in a very universal way. And you can literally classify all possible CFTs based on the universality and, and not just the scaling symmetry, but the additional symmetries that are in the system. And it's completely determined by, uh, by these aspects. And this is the importance of, the, of conformal field theories in real life physics. Now, with these ingredients, I've now reviewed for you what ADS is. I have reviewed in a lightning way what a conformal field theory is. It's just a special quantum field theory which has emergent scaling invariance. And you can now state very concretely what the ADS CFT correspondence is. And this was in particular formulated by four gentlemen, Gupser, Klemakinov, Polyakov, and Witten. That's what GKPW stands for. And what they conjectured and uh, by, uh, by extensive tests and in certain particular ways, it's almost derived right now. They, can, they showed you what the precise relationship is between a, a conformal field theory and a theory on ADS space. And what they showed is that if you take a CFT with such an operator that you couple to a source, to generate all the correlation functions. This is therefore the generating functions of all correlation functions of the operator O. You can equivalently compute all these correlation functions by considering an appropriate anti-de-sitter theory and evaluating the path integral on this anti-de-sitter space in such a way where the boundary value of, the, of this field on the conformal boundary is identified with the source for this operator Oh, and this is the statement of the ADS CFT correspondence, right? And then the, what you need uh, a little bit more is you need some dictionary. If you consider a specific operator O, what is the corresponding field phi that you need here? Now it's rather easy to see that the quantum numbers of this field O must relate to the quantum numbers of this field phi. So in particular, it's representation under the Lorentz group tells you what the uh, way it should act at an ADS. It should have the same transformations on the Lorentz group. That means that the energy momentum tensor TAB, which is a, symmet uh, a two tensor with symmetrite indices, the natural field here, which is a symmetrized tensor with two indices, is the metric field itself GAB. Right? And you already see, therefore, that this is a dynamical gravity theory. An object which has a single vector index A corresponds to a gauge field A here, and a simple scalar field or a Dirac field or a spin uh, fermionic operator corresponds to a scalar of a Dirac field. And this is nothing more than a fact saying that the spin and the charge of this operator should relate to the spin and the charge of this field uh, uh, on this side. But those are the easy identifications left and right. And what, what I will show uh, in, in the next lecture after we have a break is that there are some more subtle identifications on the left-hand side. In particular, remember what I said is that these operators are now no longer just as classified by their spin, the representation on the Lorentz group, but they're also classified by their scaling dimension, the conformal dimension of this operator. This turns out to relate to the mass of this field in ADS. And we will show this in the next lecture. And also, this, this source of this operator, we've already shown by the GKPW that that corresponds to the boundary value of the field. But you can also know that the vacuum expectation value of this operator corresponds to the boundary value of the radial momentum of this field. This, remember, this ADS has uh, here has, I've identified the field phi with the boundary value of ADS. So there's this radial direction of ADS. It is an extra direction in this system. And we will tell you in a moment what this extra direction does. But the radial momentum of this field evaluated at the boundary turns out to be related to the VEV of this operator. And this is, the, this is part of this, this ADS CFT dictionary, and you can extend it. Uh, We've already seen that the global space-time symmetries corresponds to the isometries here. And 
some other aspects that I will talk about tomorrow um, and on Wednesday is that the temperature in the system turns out to correspond to the Hawking temperature of a black hole and a phase transition uh, in the system turns out to correspond to an instability of black holes. But those are features that I will uh, explain to you uh, as we go along tomorrow. Uh, and uh, um, sorry, first in first instance in the second lecture today and then tomorrow and Wednesday uh, further. So this is actually what I wanted to tell you uh, in the first lecture. Um, I went a little faster uh, than I expected, but please let me know if you have any questions at this moment. No questions, no questions. What is uh, the, the best uh, thing to do is to, that we take the scheduled break and regroup at, um, um, I believe it would be uh, almost an hour and a half from now. Or should I continue? But then my next lecture will be um. short. Let me see. Uh, probably we have 30 minutes. Uh, we have about uh, 25 okay. minutes uh, official right. time. It's totally up to you. Mm. Um, I think it's also up to the, 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 the students if they are tired, uh, but um, um, if, if it's up to me, then um, just in view of I, how I scheduled uh, is, is the, the, the next part I had scheduled for the sec second lecture uh, of today. I see, I see. Then, then uh, let's stop here. Mm. Yeah, mm. and then uh, what I can yeah. what I can recommend yeah. for the students if is that yes. they, mm -hmm. they try to do these mm -hmm. three uh, problems uh, in the main mm -hmm. in the meantime. Okay, great. Yep. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, I think we can stop the first lecture at this moment. So let me ask again: Can we have any other questions or comments from the audience? I mean, any kind of questions. Yes, please, please do. It, ha it helps. <laughs> uh, so, mm. Sorry, I have a question. Sure. So you said, so CFT is, CFT has a scaling invariance. Yes. But uh, if we consider quantum effect, I think there is a possibility of uh, violation of scaling invariance because of quantum anomaly. Yes. Then, so sometimes the beta function is non-zero due to quantum anomaly. So That's then correct. my question is, is there a bulk picture of non-zero beta function due to quantum anomaly? Yes. So, so, so most conformal anomalies uh, are only present if you put the conformal field theory itself on a curved space time. So for instance, in a, in a one plus one dimensional CFT, you may know that the uh, conformal anomaly is proportional to the um, uh, to the, the, Ritchie, the Ritchie tensor of the manifold that the conformal field theory lives on. So if it's flat, there's no anomaly. So that, that's, the easy, that's the easy way out, okay? But in principle, it's there. And um, you can, rec you can, you can uh, reconstruct this from um, ADS-CFT itself as well. So you can... Uh, in fact, not so much in uh, this lecture and not so much uh, tomorrow either, uh, but precisely on Wednesday, uh, I will start to, uh, to, to generalize ADS-CFT to uh, more general theories where you, you do have scale dependence in the theory. So this is a very good question, but you, 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 can, you can even bootstrap it further that, that once you know the, the ADS-CFT, you can, you can generalize this by indeed uh, building a scale in the system. But let me postpone uh, the details of that discussion a little bit to, uh, it will be mostly on Wednesday. 
although the first instance will be already tomorrow. But it's a very good question. So please keep that in mind when you, when you see this uh, going on. For, as a first introduction, we are going to consider this idealized situation where we have exact beta, uh, beta function zero and, and the anomaly vanishes. Thank you. Any other questions? Good. Good. Can I have uh, some time to discuss with you about this um, very basic aspect sure. of this? Sure. Uh, we know, uh, as you just said, that ADS space is homogeneous, right? Yes. So any point is equivalent to any other. Yes. On the other hand, uh, we also uh, well know that the ADS space is a box. So that means there's some gravitational potential is there so that if, if we just send out any stone, then it just come back. But it's also, uh, I guess, uh, well known. Yes. So now the question is, suppose we put one stone, uh, I mean, at some position. And mm -hmm. then the, if that position is not described by uh, uh, as a center, then it should move toward the, that uh, coordinate center. That is apparent, uh, um, I mean, the uh, what so-called uh, I mean, gravitational potential is the same. Mm -hmm. So that is, it seems to me that is a kind of a paradoxical. Yeah, it, 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 um, I, I've, I've, I've puzzled about this myself. <laughs> it looks paradoxical, but... Um, um, so, so what is your view? Um, the... Uh, um, The 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 view. Well, what do I want to say? Is is that if you if you only have one particle, right? Then um, um, the, you you can always find coordinates where it just sits in the in the center and it doesn't move. And so you can show that this this motion is just an, an artifact of, of your observer. Um, once you have two particles, there's really uh, a, a relative motion, of course, between the two. Right. So the question is, uh, how come I mean the uh, such a so-called force is uh, coordinate dependent? Yeah. So there there isn't really a, a force, right? Um, yeah, that is uh, the, the, the thing which I want to realize. That is uh, how so that it, it looks like it's moving. And is, uh, uh, it looks like moving, but it's just it's just freely falling. It's just moving on a geodesic, and so there's no force. Right. So where it goes to? The, where where does it go to? Yeah. Well, in its own coordinate system, it's just sitting there. Yeah, but if you what, is, what I'm saying is that it should be sitting there, right? But if yes. you just choose a different coordinate system, uh, in which co in which the position of that stone is not the center, then apparently yes. it should move to, to to toward the center. So it looks like that. I mean, the, the system, the stone's uh, motion or physics, looks like dependent on the coordinate system. So. That is a little bit confusing. Yeah, no, it is. It is very paradoxical. So if you would, uh, so if you think in terms of this cylinder, hmm. right, and you would put the stone sort of halfway between the cylinder and the boundary, hmm. right. Um, um, I, I, I won't discuss it in, in these lectures, but you can, if you can look at, if you if you would describe the motion of, of sorry, the the the, the geodesic of this. Um, of this stone, this is for the for the students. It would look like 
this stone sits in a potential well that wakes the, wants it to roll towards the the interior. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the question that Sung Jin is uh, is asking. Um, but in real life, right, the, the 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 distance from the stone to the boundary is as infinite as since it's halfway as towards towards you. What this is 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 you have taken a point of view where you as the observer are sitting at uh, the center of ADS, and and it looks like this stone wants to wants to move to you. Mm. Uh, and like I said, the geodesic equation looks like it has a potential. Mm. And if it has a potential, it looks like there is a force. And this is the, this is the paradox that Sung Jin is saying. But in real life, there is no, uh, there is no, no um, uh, well, there's no true force, although you, you can always think of it. But, but, the, uh, but the particle itself is just following geodesic motion. Right, sort of. Uh, so, the, so gravity acts, right? Because in geodesic motion does mean that the gravity uh, acts. But the, uh, uh, if you would, um, why I want to say it? Um, from the point of view of the stone itself, it's just sitting in the center of its own ADS because every point is the same, and it's not 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 moving at all. It, it doesn't experience this potential. And uh, so this sounds paradoxical, and it is it is paradoxical. But in in, in practice, uh, the um... yeah, I guess we can discuss it um, probably some later. I mean, I mean, there is there's there's clearly. I mean, mm. uh, the object is moving a hyperboloid, and there is a mm. cosmological constant. There is so there is a gravitational there is a gravitational force acting on this on this um, um, ball but the 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 um, it's not that different their, their different points are, are, are different um, Perhaps actually, the, oddly enough, the analogy with the sitter space is more uh, clear. In the sitter space, right, things move apart, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But there, it's easier to see that that uh, every point is still the same as every other point. Mm -hmm. Because once you go to a different point, it just means that everything is moving apart from that from that point, and, and that's the same in ADS. So even though there is this potential, things move, right? There is a gravitational force due to the um, cosmological constant, but still every point is the same as every other point. I, I guess that uh, the question is uh, um, sometimes people, I mean, they call there is a focusing tendency because of the falling time uh, is the same in proper uh, time. So therefore, uh, that is uh, somehow related to the tendency of the black hole formation. And uh, it seems that, uh, uh, yeah, it, it is really a property of a uh, uh, physical property of ADS, but on the other hand, uh, it looks like very much the coordinate dependent uh, property. So, well, once you have, once you talk about focusing, you have you're talking. Uh, so I I think I know what you're referring to. Yeah. Then you ha then you have you you have to have two objects or two right. particles, right? Right. And then yeah. then then you then there's uh, right. There's clearly time to the center yeah. is the yeah. same. Yeah. Whatever is the starting point. Yeah. In its own, I mean, proper time. So, uh, but if I remember correctly, what happens is that um, if you if you put say you're an observer, so you're you're not a physical object, but you're at the center of ADS, and you put an object, mm. sort of, uh, you start an object halfway or some distance away from you, yeah, right, and its geodesic actually is is sort of it it oscillates back and forth, right? 
I mean, right. they depend on the initial condition, but I suppose yeah, yeah. if you put yeah. it just a, as a stationary, right? So if we yeah, as a stationary point, yeah, n particle. Yeah. I mean the uh, in the background of a probe ADS, yeah. then it just falls to the center, and then they form yeah. what I call. Yeah. So if you do if you do any two particles, they will. Yeah form to the center yeah and then, yeah, at the, uh, because they arrive there at almost at the same time or at least uh, yeah. yeah right so uh, but, but focusing i mean it uh, yeah i mean it but is this paradoxical really, but really uh i mean the means that, uh, that this is saying that the uh this is really some uh there is some force there and then this property is uh, some physical property so the question is whether this is a coordinate dependent or not. I think I think your paradox is whether it's homogeneous or not, right? So it's, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, right. It uh, should be homogeneous at least in but, some. But uh, the the I think the homogeneous, uh, yeah. I, and I'm just thinking on my feet. This is a fun conversation, by the way. Um, it, it, think of think of two particles on the on the surface of the Earth. Right, and you put one on the equator, and you put one on on on, on some latitude, mm. and you and you and you give them the same velocity in the same direction. Right, every point on the sphere is homogeneous, so the fact that I put this on the equator doesn't matter, right? But because of the curvature of the Earth, right, they they will actually move toward each other if you start them at parallel velocities. Sorry. Mm. Um, uh, if you start them strictly parallel velocities in the right way, they will they will form different orbits, but one will go faster than the other. If you put them on a slightly different angle, they will they will. Yeah, but uh, uh, for that, I think uh, you need uh, some fine tuned velocity. But yes. here we don't need, uh, in some sense. You just uh, uh, every you you suppose that everything is just uh, stationary at arbitrary position and uh, yes. just release. Yes. And that's it. Yeah. And also, I mean, the, the so-called homogeneity is uh, very much looks like coordinate dependent thing. If you use a uh, big coordinate in your, uh, I mean, the uh, node, then looks like it's uh, homogeneous. But uh, if you use uh, your global coordinate or uh, Poincaré coordinate, I mean, yeah, for uh, uh, at least uh, uh, for the global coordinator, uh, it's not homogeneous, right? You the global, uh, they're, they're all homogeneous coordinates, but they don't look like it. I agree. Yeah, it, at least it doesn't look like. No, but but secretly it is, right? So. Yeah, but uh, uh, you need to change the boundary. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, I agree. <laughs> Mm. So, uh, yeah, very basic points are very confusing also. Yeah, of course, uh, um, the, the moment you, you regulate, right, uh, I think in ADS-CFT, right, the moment you put the boundary inward a little bit, mm. then, then you have broken it, right? The boundary, the boundary surface gives you a reference point, and then now, now you have put a dot somewhere, and then the distance to this dot, right, will the makes makes all points now different because they're there you can measure it with respect to the difference to this dot. So the moment you regulate it, you lose homogeneity. Hmm. Yeah, right. So if you comes with some better description, please help me. Yeah, I'll think about it. To get but out I, of it. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 some of these paradoxes are not always solvable. But it's a good, it's a good question. All right. So when uh, we are supposed to resume? Uh, uh, resume at, uh, resume at yeah. yep, uh, 5.30 in Korean time. Basically yeah, one, one hour. hour yeah, an hour and five minutes from so, now. So I will be back in. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. See you later. Okay. I I will. Uh, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just to be sure, let me ask again.
Uh, is there any other questions from the audience? Yeah, please do. And 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 also, if you have quite, if you you know, in in the hour pause, you realize after the fact that you've something you know, then just start the next session with these questions. Right, that would be great. I mean, that's the that's the one great part uh, of of schools that you have the chance to mm -hmm. ask even simple questions. Don't don't be don't be afraid. Yeah, I think your lecture was too clear to ask questions. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. <laughs> I, I hope so. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, good. Yep. I think good. I think one comment from the chat. Um, yep, the link will be the same, I guess. You can use the same link after the break. Yep. Okay, uh, if there's no question, uh, let's thank our speaker. So let's have a break uh, just for an hour. hour. Yeah. Yep. So see you later, all of you. Bye bye.